I am ready to go stargazing. What you got there, Marty? Well, I've heard that telescopes are called light buckets, so I brought a bucket of lights. Telescopes are called light buckets because they collect a lot of light. Uh, the bigger the telescope, the more light it collects, the more you can see. What you've got there is a bucket full of lights. That's not going to help you out. Oh, well, I, I brought my binoculars, too. Those don't have any lenses in them, Marty. I upgraded from my old pair. You know what's great about stargazing is that you don't need a pair of binoculars, you don't need a fancy telescope. All you need is a clear, dark sky and your eyes. And you can see a lot of things like the moon, planets, and under the right conditions, even the Milky Way. So why don't you turn off your bucket of lights and we'll let our eyes adjust. Well, how long is that going to take? About 30 minutes. This, this is, is STEM in 30. 30. I still like my binoculars. Okay. It's 7 30. Hey, welcome to STEM and 30, guys. We are glad that you all are here. We got a bunch of great students. Yeah, look at them go. They are ready for today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty, and we are coming to you live from the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Here at the Air and Space Museum, we have an observatory, the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory. It's got a really big telescope in it, but... Unfortunately, today it is raining here in Washington, D.C. So we have moved inside the museum. We are in the Space Race Gallery, standing in front of the Hubble Space Telescope. What you see behind me is actually the engineering model that they used, and the real Hubble Space Telescope, it's still up in space. Today we're gonna to take a look at the tools that astronomers use to find out what's out there. We'd like to welcome our friends from Riverbend Middle School. Welcome, guys. <laughs> If you are watching, uh, go to Facebook Live, put a question in the comments section, and we'll try and get to it. And we want to know where you're watching from. And if you're watching with a class, let us know the name of your school. Now, astronomers use a bunch of different types of telescopes. Some of them are here on Earth, and some of them, like Hubble, are up in space. We've got some friends who are going to demonstrate for us about how telescopes work. You guys ready? So we have this bucket of palms. So these pom-poms, each one of these represents a photon of light, uh, which is a packet of light. All right, so you guys are going to reach in, you're going to grab two big handfuls of these pom-poms. So go ahead and do that. And what we have here is we've got a couple of buckets. We've got a larger bucket and we've got a smaller bucket. And they're going to throw these pom-poms up into the air and we're going to see which bucket catches more light. Now, which bucket do you think will catch more light? Let's are you guys try. ready? Three, All right. two, one. All right, do it again. Do it one again. more time, one more time. Get a bunch of them up there. All right, go for it. All right. All right, so we're going to check back here in a couple of minutes and see which bucket caught more light. What's great about stargazing is you don't actually need a telescope. You just need a clear sky and a few basic items. Check this out. Night stargazing can be done from just about anywhere, including potentially your own neighborhood but you'll be able to see more if there aren't a lot of tall structures or light pollution. Light pollution is the brightening of the sky by artificial sources like street lights. Once you've found a location, there are some basic things you'll want to pack, including a blanket. You'll be looking up at the night sky, so lying on a blanket will keep you from getting a stiff neck. Dress appropriately for the weather. Bring food and water if you're going out for an extended period of time. You'll need a flashlight, but not any old flashlight. If you can, get one with a red light. It'll do a better job at protecting your night vision. If you have binoculars and a telescope, pack them. We're packing just binoculars for this trip. A phone is helpful to have in case of an emergency. 
It's also going to be an astronomy tool. There are a bunch of great apps that can help identify what you're looking at. Try a couple and see what works for you. Lastly, if you're going to a more isolated area, like a national park, you may want to check with your local park service about wildlife or weather. Once you get to the site and set up, give your eyes some time to adapt to the night sky. It can take up to 30 minutes for your eyes to fully adapt for the best night vision. Be careful, one quick look at a bright light or your phone screen means you'll have to start adapting all over again. Then it's time to start stargazing. With just the naked eye, you should be able to identify the moon if it's up. If you're a beginner, it might be hard to figure out what you're looking at, but an app or a star map can help. Just point your phone at the sky and it'll help you identify objects. Depending on the time of year and your location, you may see bright stars like Vega, the gas dust from the Milky Way, some planets, and even the International Space Station. If you have binoculars, even inexpensive ones, you'll be able to see some pretty cool stuff with them. Point them at the moon, and you might be able to see some craters. So as you can see, you don't need a big expensive telescope or to be out in the remote wilderness. Sometimes all you need to do is take a minute and look up. I'm now joined by astronomy educator Shauna Edson. Shauna, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. You want to talk us through this demo, what we've done here? Yeah, so we've got our two light buckets, which represent two telescopes of different sizes. And when we tossed our photons in the air, we were checking to see which light bucket could collect more. So we're going to pour them into these containers that are the same size so we can compare them. And you may not be surprised, but it looks like the bigger bucket was able to collect more light. So this is why astronomers, we call telescopes light buckets because they are just collecting light. So the bigger telescope you have, the more light you're going to be able to collect. And in astronomy, what that means is you'll be able to see fainter, farther away things with your telescope. But it's not just the, the size of the telescope, it's how long you can point it at something. Like the, the Hubble telescope found something that you really like to talk about. Yeah. So. You can have a bigger light bucket, but you can also leave the bucket open for longer. And the thing that cameras and photography did for astronomy is they made it possible to look for long periods of time. So the Hubble telescope, like what's behind me here, in 1995, they found the darkest, blackest patch of sky. We couldn't see anything in it. It's actually near the Big Dipper in the sky. So it's a blank patch, so they took the Hubble and they pointed it at that dark patch of sky, and they left the light bucket open for 10 days. So there was a lot of time for light to gather in the telescope. And when they looked at the picture, what had been blank, dark sky had thousands of galaxies in it. Each of the little dots or blobs that you see in the video here, this is, each of those is a galaxy. So this is what's known as the Hubble Deep Field Galaxies image. And it changed how we see the universe, how we do astronomy. Because if what we thought was empty actually had thousands of galaxies, imagine that in the entire rest of the sky. It, it changed how we see our universe. So let's say I want to scope out some telescopes, but ah. I don't want to buy one. What, what do I need to do? Well, the thing that I always recommend to people is that you find your local astronomy club. That's going to be a group of people who maybe aren't professional astronomers but have telescopes and love astronomy. They often have star parties. So these images are of sort of a stargazing party. You can find your local astronomy club on the NASA Night Sky Network. You can look up clubs near you. You can look up events. This is a great resource. You can also find sky maps, lists of what to look for in the sky. But if you find your local astronomy club, it's full of people who love telescopes, love astronomy, and you can go, you can look through people's telescopes, they will show you things you can see, and they'll tell you about the telescopes. You can try them out, you can see which kind you like, what you like to look at, and those people can even help you learn how to set it up once you have one. So it's kind of like test driving before you actually have to buy a it's car. It's exactly like test driving. Are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Let's take a video question first. Hi, my name is Maddie from Lakeview Middle School. My question is, how do you know when you find something new in outer space? I love this. How do you know when you find something new? Well, I think we, a lot of times we think that scientific discovery sounds like, aha, I have found it. 
It's usually not like that. Most of the time, when you're about to make a discovery, what you say is, huh, that's weird. So it's when you're surprised. Like people who study galaxies, you saw that picture of the Hubble Deep Field, thousands of galaxies there. People who study galaxies have looked at thousands and thousands of pictures of galaxies. So they're used to how they look. Okay, a spiral shape, you, know, you kind of know what they're gonna look like. When you see one that's irregular or weird or is like merging with another galaxy or something else is happening, when you see something that goes, huh, that doesn't look like anything I've ever seen before, that's when you know you found something that might be a big new deal in astronomy. Okay, uh, let's take an online question. Is there some wobble of the spacecraft when you open the aperture for that long? That's a great question. So for Hubble, say for the deep field galaxies, there's a covering on the end that opens, but most of the time that just stays open. In a camera, you would cover it and only open the shutter when you take a picture. With Hubble, the cover's open unless they're doing maintenance on it or unless it's pointed at the sun. What they do is turn the detector off or on. But even so, you have to be very gentle and slow when you move a spacecraft because you don't want to mess up its orbit. It takes Hubble 15 minutes to turn 90 degrees. So that's the same rate as the minute hand on a clock. Let's uh, take an audience question. Great. Is there any evidence of extraterrestrial life and how do we determine that? Is there any evidence of extraterrestrial life? Oh yes, I do love this question. So we have not yet found definite evidence that there is life somewhere else, but we're pretty sure it's got to exist. There are so many planets and galaxies and stars, there's gotta be life somewhere. And the way that we would know that is we would look at the gases in the atmospheres of what's called an exoplanet or an extrasolar planet, a planet around a star, not the sun. We have confirmed the existence of about 3,700 exoplanets thus far, and we keep adding new ones almost every week. And if we were to take a telescope, an advanced telescope, like say the James Webb or some, of, some others, we look at the atmosphere of the planet. We living creatures breathe out carbon dioxide. There's lots of planets with carbon dioxide in their atmospheres. But life like plants makes oxygen and other life forms make methane. Now oxygen and methane tend to destroy each other in atmospheres. They don't tend to hang around very long unless there's a bunch of stuff that's alive that's making more of both of those gases. So if we find an exoplanet, we point a telescope at it and we measure that there's oxygen and methane in the atmosphere that'll be a pretty good indication that there's something alive there and we need to look at it further. We have an observatory here on our grounds and we're open during the day mm -hmm. and you spend a lot of time looking at the sun. How do we, we do. do that without hurting ourselves? Right, so you can do astronomy during the day because you can look at the sun and there are several safe ways to look at the sun. Now, you would never want to look through a regular telescope without a filter because that will burn your eyes. But there are safe ways to look at the sun. The simplest is projection. So what I've got here, this is a sun spotter. And this is really kind of a telescope that's folded up and projecting. So the sun's light comes in through this lens up top. It bounces off of three mirrors. So that's the folding of the telescope. It goes through a lens and it projects onto the white paper. So rather than looking at the sun, which wouldn't be safe with just your eyes, we're looking at the projection. We see a little white circle the sun's surface, if there are sunspots, we'll see those as little dark dots. And it's something that several people can stand around and see together as opposed to just one eyepiece on a telescope. But we do have a very big telescope outside. How do we look at the sun safely with that? Well, so we rig up a projection device onto a normal telescope. So out at the observatory, we have a picture of it here. The white bell-shaped thing is our sun gun. That's actually an empty plastic flower pot. It's super simple. What it's doing is it's holding the projection screen material. It's on the edge of the telescope. So the light comes through the telescope, projects onto the screen. So when you're looking at it, you're seeing the projection. You're not looking into the light beam and the light has been spread out. So it's safe for your eyes. And in that, you can also see sunspots. You can see if the edge is wiggling and a whole group can see it all together. Now, all this looking at the sun came in handy this summer. Yes, it did. When we had the solar eclipse, I can't see a thing, when we had the solar <laughs> eclipse and we were giving these out. Yes, so the reason you can't see a thing through these is they have a very strong filter and the sun is pretty much the only thing bright enough to see. So projection is one safe way to look at the sun, but filters are another. Now, there are some telescopes that are specifically built for the sun that have a filter built inside them. 
The glasses like this are meant to go just over your eyes, but the filters in here block most of the sun's light and they let through just enough that you can see the sun. If there are big sunspots, you can see them with this. And during the eclipse, we could watch the moon go across it and see the sun's shape change. So you can hang on to your eclipse glasses and you can use them any day to look at the sun. As long as there's no holes or damage, you can check out the sun with these anytime you like. We are not able to be outside at the observatory, but we do have a tour that you guys can watch. The National Air and Space Museum is the place to see many one-of-a-kind artifacts. And it's also home to the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory. Here, guests can gaze through different types of telescopes, discovering features of the sun, the phases of Venus, and other wonders of the universe. Why would we build an observatory in humid, light-polluted Washington, D.C.? The Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory puts the telescopes where the people are. Some of the visitors to our observatory are using a telescope for the first time. Visitors to the observatory are doing things astronomers do and becoming astronomers themselves. You can actually see a lot from here too, even in the city. Our astronomy education staff and volunteers are here to answer your questions. This is actually the reason the stars twinkling. They're here to teach you about what you're seeing and show you how to safely use a telescope. It's a regular telescope, there's an eyepiece inside there. The observatory is open to the public and it's free. We invite you to come in for a visit during museum hours. And we also have special nighttime observing events. For those who can't make it to the museum, the observatory live streams the view from its telescopes. We also hold special events for major astronomical happenings like eclipses. The skies are for everyone. You don't have to go to the highest mountain or the darkest desert to be able to observe them. All you have to do is look up. So come check out the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory. We're joined by Dr. Genevieve de Messier, the Astronomy Education Program Manager here at the National Air and Space Museum. Genevieve, thanks for talking with us. It's my pleasure. Now, you run the observatory and we've got telescopes in there, but let's start small. Tell us about small telescopes. I do like small telescopes because then I get to look through them. Uh, telescopes help us see things better than we could with just our eyes. So when I look through a small telescope, I like to, like to look at Jupiter, because with Jupiter you can see the bands in its atmosphere and you can see the moons going around Jupiter. Or if I go to a dark place, I can use a small telescope to look at things like the spiral arms of galaxies against the blackness of space. Wow. Now let's take that up a little bit and talk about bigger observatories. I was lucky that I got to go to Chile, which is one of the best places in the world to build telescopes because the, uh, the skies are dark, it's uh, high up, and the sky's really clear. So research astronomers like to build telescopes, really big ones in Chile and other places around the world because they can see even fainter things with even better detail. For example, the Gemini telescope in Chile can even see planets going around their stars. One of the ways it does that is to beat the blurring of the atmosphere by shooting a laser into the atmosphere, which helps it change the shape of the mirror to beat the blur. That is so cool. So now let's take it up another notch, a little bit higher, up into outer space. Right, so why would you take a telescope to space? It's a lot more expensive to build it there. However, that's another way for you to beat the blur of the atmosphere. For example, the Hubble Space Telescope gets really clear, sharp views of the universe. And it has produced the most beautiful, iconic, inspiring views of the universe, which has inspired people like me to get involved in astronomy. Now, everything that we've talked about so far uses visible light, but there are other ways to observe the universe, right? Exactly right. So there's ultraviolet light, which burns our skin. There's infrared light, which we can look at with, uh, with night vision goggles. And then there's radio light. Your car radio uses, it collects radio light and it turns it into music that you can hear. Radio is also a great way to study the universe. And you got to visit a radio Yeah, well, I got a chance to go to the VLA, the very large array, and you've been to a, a large radio telescope as well. That's right, the Alma Array in Chile. Nice. Now, when we use radio telescopes, one of the things that we can observe are black holes. Tell us about that. Right, so uh, when you observe a black hole, you're actually observing the effect of the black hole on the, uh, on the gas and the other objects around it. Okay, so we've got a little demonstration here. Come on over, guys. We've got some friends with us, and they have a big 
Well, it looks like you're going to catch somebody jumping off of a building here, right. but tell like us what we're looking at here. Yeah. So what we're looking at here is a big circle of stretchy fabric. And this represents the fabric of the universe, which is called space-time. It's pretty flat right now, right? And now let's take something heavy and put it in the middle. So that could represent a star, or it could be something even heavier and denser, like a black hole. If this was a real black hole, I want you to imagine taking that and stretching it through the basement of the museum. Imagine how much that would stretch space in that case. So everything with mass is bending space like this, which means that uh, objects that are traveling around it with mass follow curved paths. Another word for that curved path is called an orbit. So that's how a planet goes around, the, uh, around a star or how stars and other gas go around black holes. Okay, everybody, help me out here. Let's, let's show some orbits here. So we're going to explore different ways that massive objects roll around space, but following curved paths because space has a curved shape. Now, teachers, here's what's really cool about black holes. We've got some friends at the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio yeah. Telescope out in California. Now, this is a 10-story tall, 400-ton radio telescope that your students can run from their classrooms. And what's really neat about it is they can observe black holes, they can observe radio waves coming from Jupiter, they can even help with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI. But wait, there's more. There's a ton of math involved with this, but the students will be doing real science. And that science has actually been published in scientific journals and used in real science. And to me, that is incredibly cool that your students can not only run a giant radio telescope, but the data can be used in real science. Head over to their website to learn more about that. Now we've talked about kind of the current uh, telescopes that we're using. Shall we take a look at what's coming next? Yes, let's look at the future of astronomy. Hi, I'm Peter Cullum, the voice of Transformers Optimus Prime. During the last 24 years, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has brought the wonders of the universe to us here on Earth. But as powerful as Hubble is, there are secrets about the cosmos that even it cannot reveal. To unlock those secrets, NASA is building Hubble's scientific successor the James Webb Space Telescope. Webb will be much larger than Hubble, so large that it must be folded to fit into its rocket for launch. Once in orbit, one million miles from Earth, Webb will transform into an observatory with a tennis court-sized sun shield, a 21-foot wide primary mirror from a million miles away. Webb will be able to peer back in time to see the universe light up with its first stars and galaxies. Witness galaxies evolve across cosmic time and even explore the atmospheres of alien worlds. The James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's next generation eyes for deep space exploration. Are you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Definitely. Let's start with an audience question. How do we know what the radio waves we receive from space mean? So that's a great question. How do we know that the radio waves we're receiving are really from space? That's actually a question that people who study radio waves sometimes have to answer because they're not sure if they're getting this radio signal from something on the ground or something from space. The, some of the first people to work on this, uh, so there are uh, two people who are trying to build the best radio telescope they could. And they kept getting sort of a radio buzz that they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. It seemed like it was coming from everywhere. They even thought it might be pigeon poop on their telescope. So they had to clean that off and try to eliminate everything else. And finally, finally the only thing they could conclude was that it was coming from space. What they had detected was the fading flash of the Big Bang. Wow. Sometimes science happens by accident. <laughs> Let's take a video question. Hello, my name is Will, and I'm from Lakeview Middle School. My question is, what's the best telescope for personal use? Personal use telescope. Well, you don't even need a telescope, right? Right? Well, the best telescope for personal use is one you will actually use. 
Um, like I said before, going to an astronomy club and trying out other telescopes, talking to people is a great way to find out. But binoculars are actually the best first telescope. You can see a lot with these. You can see craters and details, shadows on the moon. You can often see a couple of the moons around Jupiter, and this is great for star clusters also. Now there's a number on the binoculars. This one says eight times 20. So the eight times means that's how much it magnifies. And actually 25 is the size of the lenses. Uh, we have a pair of 10 by 50s here. And 10 times magnification is, is good enough. You should be able to see a couple of moons of Jupiter. You can see the oblong shape of, shape of Saturn. And you can also use it for hiking and bird watching too. Let's take an online question. Uh, what is the status of the James Webb Telescope? Great question. So the James Webb Telescope is scheduled to launch from French Guiana in 2020. And it will go into an orbit that is pretty far from the Earth, but it will be uh, close, uh, cl closer to the Earth than the other planets. And being that far from the Earth will shield it from the heat of the Earth because it's trying to find very cold things. And so if it's near something warm like the Earth, that messes up its view. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. Uh, we do have another program coming up next month, and it is out of this world. Oh, my goodness! <laughs> wow! That is incredible! Right now, the International Space Station is orbiting the Earth 250 miles up, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. On board are astronauts Ricky Arnold and Drew Feustel, who are spending six months on the International Space Station in conjunction with future engineers. STEM and 30 will be connecting with these astronauts as they orbit the Earth, discussing 3D printing and asking questions about life in space. Be sure to tune in on June 5th for this live talk with astronauts in space. We'd like to thank Sean and Genevia for joining us today. We also want to remind everybody that you can follow uh, the Smithsonian Observatory on Twitter, at SI Observatory. Be sure to check that out. And when you come downtown, we really would like you to stop by the observatory and say hello, probably on a better day than the one we've been having today. Yeah, if you're here on a sunny day, be sure to stop by. They've got the big telescope inside the dome, and a lot of times they'll have sunspotters and other telescopes set up outside, and it's really, really cool. And a lot of people can see that that sunspotter. It's not just one person per telescope, but a, a crowd can get in there. Exactly. We'd also like to thank our show sponsor, Boeing, for bringing the show to you today. And today we're going to wrap up with some incredible images from the Hubble Deep Space Telescope. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.